Kia ora koutou fan, kia ora chewy. Hi, yeah. <laughs> that's, that's my new my new intro. I'm trying it out. That was just a little karate version intro. <laughs> just a little karate chop. Yeah. Oh, good, good. Well, well done. I think we can add that into the uh, opening of the show every single night now. Into the karate the, into the rotation. Yeah. So what does it goes? Hey, yeah. Well, hey, the... yeah. Okay, got it. Cool, man. I'm excited by this new intro we've got. How you been, Chewy? What's been going on today? Anything exciting? Happening? Oh, good. Um, beautiful day here in town. So I've been out in the garden, walking the dog, enjoying the day. Yeah, it's been a bit of a cracker, but we've got to be careful because obviously we're talking Auckland again today. So we. Don't oh, like... I feel so bad. I feel bad. I know it's hard when it's too hot. Eh? It's too hot and sunny, and it's like, what do we do? So we could send some up north. Just send it. Just blow it off. Blow it up north. Oh, there's water restrictions. Oh, there's, there's water restrictions over in Moscow. Somewhere the balance is gone. Yeah, I, th- I think it's North Dunedin. That's what I think, just between me and you. Um, so tonight we are looking at a bunch of stuff around Auckland. We are talking uh, to Efiso Collins in just a second. Uh, he is on the ground in Auckland looking at what's happening right there. I think right now he's at an evacua- evacuation centre, so we'll get the, the latest update from Efiso shortly. Uh, I want to have a look at some of the stuff that uh, Christopher Luxon said today. Apparently he thinks... And on some level, I kind of understand some people might get this, that all the schools shouldn't necessarily be closed in Auckland, that some should be open, some should be closed. Uh, We live in a region uh, in Dunedin where sometimes there's a weather event in one part of the city, like snow in the hills, and they shut all the school down. And it's for very good reason, which we will talk to you about when we look at the clip uh, for Mr. Luxon a bit later on in this hour. And then also uh, from uh, the University of Victoria, Wellington University of Victoria or Victoria University of Wellington, whatever they call themselves now, uh, Professor James Renwick is going to be joining us. Now, he wrote a really interesting article recently uh, that says uh, what Auckland has just had is basically the first of many events to come. Yeah. Uh, and he is a professor of uh, ge- oh, geography. And he has an interest in how the atmosphere and atmospheric conditions move. So it's kind of weather in general. And so I've got a chat with him that I recorded this afternoon that if you're one of our patrons, you may have already seen because it's up on our Patreon already. And he, we, me and him have a bit of a chat about uh, what's happened in Auckland, what we can do about it, and uh, what we can expect to see, especially around the issues of climate change and what's happening right now. Before we get to Efeso, speaking of our uh, Patreons, if you want to become a patron of ours, if you want to support the work we're doing, then you can head to uh, patreon.com forward slash big hairy news. Uh, there are seven la- uh, levels of support you can give us there. But as we always say, the biggest way that people can support us and support what we're doing is to be our advocates, to share what we do, uh, to let people know about what we are uh, talking about and doing, to share our clips. Uh, but if you do want to get on board, uh, you get some early access to various uh, content that we put out there. If I probably can show you that, can't I? If I scroll down, they'll probably be right there. Or you can't see it, but that's right there is the uh, the in, the conversation with Professor Jane Renwick that we're going to be playing later on today. Early access through that as well. Um, so patreon.com forward slash big hairy news. So let's go to Auckland. In fact, let's just bring Efeso Collins into the conversation right now. Good evening, Efeso. How are you, mate? Oh, kia ora kōru, and thanks for having me this evening. Really well, thank you. It's uh, pretty, it's it's nice and calm at the moment, but I'm expecting the downpour to, to hit this part of Auckland uh, in the next little while. So there's uh, yeah, a bit of uh, nervousness around the place at the moment as people expect quite a heavy downpour soon. Yeah, so, so we got you on your phone just coming out of a meeting. So why don't you just give us an update of the meeting you've been in? And what you've come out of, because, you know, people watching in Auckland who maybe watch this back in a few hours will get some of the latest information via you, via the meeting. So what, what, what have you just been to and what's going on from that meeting? 
Yeah, so I'm at the, the evacuation centre here in Randwick Park. It's in the south of Auckland. It's in Manudeo. It's the southernmost part of uh, where we've got evacuation centres at the moment. Tonight, we've got about four or five families that will be spending the night here. So a lot of them aren't actually from Manudeo. They've come from Mangere. I was at the Mangere evacuation centre yesterday. Uh, and so these families are just kind of getting ready to settle in for the evening. Uh, this is a community facility. So it's a council facility that they're using at the moment, you've got right. civil defence staff here, council staff here, and a whole range of services. So you've had Housing New Zealand come through, MSD, all of the services that you'd expect to come through. And the meeting was about just making sure that we've got people feeling comfortable, that there's enough people, feeling like there's enough space here for them. Uh, and it's making sure that everyone's comfortable. You know, there's a lot of children around the place too. We're making sure that there's spaces for them to be able to move around and that there's a good flow of food and real generosity being shown by the community. There's like people coming in with food all the time, blankets, uh, bedding, anything that's needed. So a real uh, big ups to the community who have really rallied for these families over these really challenging days. I'd be interested to know as well, if you so, what is your role at the moment in Auckland? Like, like you ran for mayor, you missed out there. I think um, most people are now regretting that, but we might talk about that in a second. But um, what are you actually doing? And I guess what I'm also wondering, are you getting involved on a, an official level in some way or are you just an Aucklander helping out? Yeah, I'm just here helping out, not involved in any official way at all. I was away at the weekend when the when the rain started to fall and when the flooding will happen. So I only touched uh, base back in Auckland yesterday, so got around as much as I could. But I think what it shows is it just it's just important for all of us to be part of the community. And you know, many of us don't need the title. Eh? We don't need, I used to be the ward councillor from Manuko uh, for the last uh, six years. But I think what's important is that people know that we're here and I'm uh, yeah, I, I stood unsuccessfully for the office of the mayor, but this is my community. These are the people I shop with, I go to church with, I hang out with. And this is the poorer end of our community. Many would have heard through the news that a lot of the people in Mangere and in South Auckland felt pretty neglected in the initial responses from council. And I just think it's important that they know people who were in leadership roles or I'm still heavily involved with uh, community organisations and churches. We're on the ground in the community anyway. And a lot of the people who are here now people I know from local churches around the place. So I just think it's important people know that we're here and that we only don't we don't just turn up when we're running for office, that we're always here. So that's that's my role at the moment. Um, one of the things that I saw on Twitter today is that the there's been so many donations uh, to various evacuation centres and, and community groups that they're having to redistribute them around because some have too too much stuff. Yeah. That's that's amazing. I mean, the, the start of this whole storm cycle, all the news was dominated on what went wrong. It's it, it's only now that we're hearing about what's going right, and it all seems to be from on the ground groups. Is yeah, Chippy, I think, think? Yeah, I, I think we will probably, you know, if I uh, take us back to what happened during COVID, you know, the vaccination rates went up because we trusted the communities and we resourced local communities to get the vaccination out. And I think that's just that just exemplifies the community spirit at the moment. The people have been really generous. Yesterday I was in Mount Roscoe. They had a lot of mattresses being donated. And we knew that in other parts of Auckland they needed mattresses. So it's just redistributing. But wherever we're able to access a lot of these resources, then people are ringing and say, look, we're, we've got more than enough mattresses or blankets. One of the things that people have been asking for today is towels. Uh, and so we've just been mm -hmm. able to move it around. And people are on the ground all the time. So you've got the evacuation centres that's supporting people. There's food here. There's, you know, it's safe. It's warm for people. But we've also got teams of people who are out on the streets on the ground. And you'll see some of the stuff with people TikToking. They're still getting into families. We're still talking to families who don't want to leave their houses. You know, if you haven't been red stickered and, and people aren't of that you know, in the position where they have to leave and, you know, they want to stay home and you understand that. And so it takes some talking through with people to engage with them. So they do leave, they trust us and they trust that their stuff's going to be okay because that's one of the, the anxieties they'll be leaving with mm. is if I leave the home, you know, is someone going to come and take our goods? And so it's making sure they understand it's good security. Around. But by golly, this is a huge response from the community. It just goes to show that, you know, whether you've got lots or little, Everyone's trying to share, and I think it's beautiful response from the community. Hey, Afiso, explain to me and those of us who maybe used to live in Auckland, so know the region, because we've been hearing about West Auckland and North Auckland, but you mentioned Mangere. Now, I grew up in yeah. Hillsborough, right on the other side of the harbour from Mangere, so I know the area really well. Um, I spent my adult life pretty much in Titarangi out west. Now, 
for for people who don't know, it kind of goes Titarangi, Mount Roskill, or Titarangi, Newland, Mount Roskill, Hillsborough, across the harbour, Mangadi Bridge, Mangadi. Now, I think about West Auckland as sort of not really Hillsborough, but Mount Roskill further out to the Waitax. And you're talking about South Auckland and the people of Mangadi not getting the same response that maybe they should have got. So how bad was it in more South Auckland? Because the news headlines are all talking about West and North. Yeah, I, th I think what it showed was that the slow, confusing response that came from council and probably the mayor as a result of that meant that people who were suffering at the time and really worried and anxious at the time weren't getting the kind of support that they needed. And so the, the I think that the headlines, even the headlines that I was picking up on Twitter and just yeah. reading online from outside of Auckland seem to be talking a lot about the North Shore, which is really important. It's important that everyone feels, OK, we've got some attention and there's going to be some help. But often it's the case in South Auckland where people feel like, well, no one's here for us. No one's making sure that our concerns are being heard. And even the, the setup of evacuation centres, like this one here in Manurewa was set up, you know, was set up late, but it meant that people had to get involved. And for some, some time, people from Mangere, which is about, oh, if you're driving, maybe a 15, 20 minute drive from here, we're coming to this centre because there was nothing thing available to them in Māngere. And I think that probably is evidence of the sluggish response that we got from council. And I know this all happened so quickly, but it's important that when you're in, in crisis management mode, you've got to get out there, you've got to front foot this stuff, you've got to be out there to tell people, look, we're going to provide comfort, we're going to give you reassuring messages and make sure that people know. And I think part of the challenge has been the bureaucracy because there were numerous churches that I was texting from outside of Auckland yeah. saying to ministers of local churches, and you'll know much, you all know that the South Auckland way, which is the churches are here, it's a very churched community, and yep. they were saying, look, we're happy to open up our churches, do you need schools? There were schools calling us, the Mount Roskill Centre is Wesley Primary School, so the schools are all available. I think the challenge with the bureaucracy was, you know, people were saying, oh, well, that's not a, that's not an identified centre for civil defence, and when you're, when you're in the kind of circumstances that many of these families found themselves in on Friday night, you just got to work with what you've got, and then we can sort the rest out later, and I think that was probably what led to a lot of the disappointment and feelings of neglect, especially from people in South Auckland. The, how do you think, now, I don't know how you want to respond to the next line of questioning, uh, because obviously there may people may look at this question and think there's an element of bias to your response, but how do you think the mayor and the council have responded to this? Yeah, I, again, you know, I've described it as sluggish, and I think it was sluggish. You know, I understand that there's a whole lot of processes going on in the background where the bureaucrats are giving advice, but there comes a time when you just got to step into a leadership role and say to people, this is what I believe is happening. It's important that we get out and we front foot a lot of this activity. So yeah, I'm, I'm a bit disappointed that it came so late, and then you know, rather than get out there and try and defend decisions that were made that were erroneous, erroneous then what we've got to do is say, look, let's just apologise for them and let's work together to get going. And I still think, you know, there have been people, you know, I'm, I'm not joining the chorus of people, especially locals out here, local leaders who've been calling for resignation. So I'm not part of that camp. But I think what that shows us is the level of anger and frustration that people felt like it was too slow. And so, you know, council's got to do better to work with communities. We've often at council had challenges around the way we engage with communities who don't normally participate in our consultations consultation process. Well, this is an example of what happens when we're not tied in or hooked into the communities. We can't access people quickly like the local churches, like local youth organisations, because we haven't got that reach and we've got to reset the way we think. We can't just do it you know, the same old consultative way. We've got to look at communities that are pretty diverse, that don't speak English as their first language, and that's got to be the approach that we take, especially for areas like this. Look, I have to ask you this question, and there may not be an answer to it, but people are coming on on the text saying it, an eloquent gentleman that would have made an articulate mayor. The, I, I, I don't know if you're a church person or you're just associated with the churches, so pardon me if this language offends you, but how did this fucking mouth breeder win? Like, how did he, how did he actually win? When you look at everything about him now, shows the, the incompetence from my perspective, an honest our belief that comes from the top. What happened in that cycle to get the people of Auckland to say, well, this moron is better than this man that we're talking to tonight? I can't see it. And that's probably partly my bias, but what happened? Yeah, I think there are a number of things. And, yeah, I think as a campaign team, we've had a bit of an election autopsy on, on what went 
uh, so wrong for us. But look, look, I'll be honest with you. That we saw from the polling, our polling was pretty consistent right the way through. But as uh, as candidates from the right started to drop out of the race, what we saw was people trying to, you know, get, get behind their candidate. And with, with two weeks to go in the election, it was pretty clear to me from the polling that we weren't going to be successful. We'd been leading the whole way, but everyone got behind uh, the you know Wayne Brown, who's currently in there. So, look, I, there was definitely that part, and I think the right organised themselves such that they were splitting their own vote, and they got behind one person, and I think that's who they ended up with. They just went with the candidate that suited what they wanted to hear, and, you know, there was a whole, there's very little policy discussion. It was all around, I'm going to fix these things, and I think that there was probably a level of anger and frustration throughout the city that he was tapping into. And I think that's what you got. You just got people who were voting because they were angry. They feel like, you know, nothing's been done. Our rates are too high, all of that. I wanted to have a really honest conversation about why rates needed to be at particular levels. Why, you know, this the incident that's happened over the weekend shows that we've underinvested in our infrastructure for way yeah. too long. And we can't just, you know, if we're not getting money from the Crown, I was saying we've got to go to the Crown, we can get $300 million a year just on the GST back from rates. But we've also got to look at other funding sources that are going to support us and not just rates but if you're going to consistently keep rates down it means you're going to consistently under invest and that just in you know we can't just do nothing with the city and i think it needed a vision but i think you know to be honest with your, your question it's a there was a, a real level of anger that i picked up throughout the campaign people were angry they're angry about three waters now people are talking about well maybe we should review that given yeah. what's happened on the week exactly you know? what about the infrastructure yeah. let's fix our infrastructure so the government had an idea to fix the infrastructure. Everyone went, oh, no. And now it's like, uh-oh. Yeah. Even even the, a bunch of right-wing commentators are like, oh, you know, the infrastructure's got to be fixed. And then in the next breath, they're like, but, you know, that Three Waters, that was a bad thing. Look, we've said all the way through here, Afiso, that the communications around Three Waters has been abysmal, but the idea yeah. is, is solid. But what the people of Auckland have got themselves, with the greatest of respect to the people who voted, is a mayor now who, if he had his choice, would rather be playing tennis than speaking to the people of Auckland about an emergency, a once-in-a-50-year emergency. If he could have picked and had a choice, as we see from his text messages, he would rather have not been communicating with the people of Auckland. That's what they voted for. Yeah, no, I was really disappointed to read that. Look, I, I understand when we were on the campaign trail, you know, he talked about some of his interests. And I thought, oh, that's really cool. You know, we got to know each other really well. But at a time like this, when Aucklanders need leadership, when they need reassurance, when they need confidence, then that's what you've got to put in front of them. And, you know, only now, lately, he's come out, he's, he's said that, you know, there's been some hiccups along the way. And I would have used slightly stronger language, but that's where we're at at the moment. <laughs> and it's difficult for people like us because we're in the community right now. This is the community that I lived in, that I've, I've grown up in. That's why you've got people, you know, I've got, there are people here who um, who are who are doing the night shift and they're, they're, they're here till six in the morning, they'll go to work and then they'll come back here. So they've virtually moved their whole life here to support wow. the families that are here. And I think that's the level of commitment Aucklanders want at the moment. So you've got to be present. People need to see you. You know, we don't expect you to come out and stop the rain. You know, obviously, you know, People are making a real mockery and memes that, you know, the issue is the rain and the rain has to stop. But, you know, of course that has to happen. But we've got to acknowledge that people need to have us present. And I think it's a really good admission that he's finally said that this is the result of climate change. You can't go through life thinking, oh, yeah, we've just got these extreme weather patterns. And it's kind of, you know, it's changed a little bit. This is climate change in action. It's not coming tomorrow. It's here now. And we've got to respond to it as a city. Yeah. Chewy? Oh, I'm I'm just sitting here. You know, you always think of the the path not taken, and <laughs> what I'm just sitting here listening to you and, and going, God, if if you'd been in in the place of Wayne Brown, would be a very different thing. Um, as as far as the election goes, like we were talking about it last night, of what an absolutely like super low turnout it was. What what do you put that down to? Is it just a disengagement in certain communities? Were they not talking to the right people? Yeah, what, what was your view? 
Yeah, I think there's a range of things there, Chippy. And uh, I, look, there's there's the very the fact that it's postal, and I think postal ballot is is so um, outdated, and we shouldn't be using postal forms. If you look at, you know, even if you look at some of the data out here, that it's you know 35 percent of Auckland voted, but you look at areas that I'm in today, they had 20 percent. One in five people turned out to vote in the poorest areas. The area that I uh, was representative of. You know, I had a huge response. Eighty-six percent of the vote came my way, but only one in five people are voting. So I actually got more raw votes in the wealthiest part of Auckland, where I only got twenty percent. You know, one in, in five of the votes. I was here. I was getting four out of five votes. So you can see the difference. So people are disengaged because it's hard. Postal voting doesn't work. Often, you know, when you've got transient communities, it's going to go to their last registered address. So it'll probably yeah. go to the house that they lived in four or five years ago and they can't even remember anything. When we were out door knocking, you know, I was picking up those purple envelopes or something, and people were saying, oh, that the person hasn't lived here in years. And so that's yeah. one of the issues. But I often think a lot of these these systems are designed for particular voters. And I'm I'm I, I want to impre impress and re-impress on the Crown now that we've got to change these systems. If you can just turn up to your local school hall, local community hall, and say, yep, yeah, my name's FB, so I, I'm, I'm not living and I'm not here in my electorate now, but I'd like to cast a vote. It all happens when you get to the national elections, but it doesn't happen like that in local yeah. government elections. And the other odd thing is we contract out the service. I think it's worth $5 million where we contract out a service. And I just think, so they've got no responsibility to go out there and engage a community, encourage them to vote. They've just got to send out voting papers and make sure they arrive. And, that, you know, that's real, that lustre. That is not a commitment to democracy. So we've really got to sort that system out. Also digitising. I mean, like, I, with, with the greatest yeah. respect to people about security, if my IID number and my bank account are, are, are basically safe, then we can do safely voting online. And that would make a... A huge difference. Hey, um, I, I kind of, when you said that it's good that Wayne Brown is acknowledging climate change now, when he read that in that second press conference he did to the bunch of drongos, um, I do feel like he was saying it and there was a little bit of sick coming up in the back of his mouth. It was the most prepared document because saying it and actually believing it is two very different things. So we'll, we will we'll see what happens from there. But before we let you go, Fiso, um, where to from here for you? I mean, is, is there like a Mount Albert you know, election knocking on your knocking on your front door or something. Yeah, I've been in discussions with people, and uh, yeah, I, I think that the the campaign was long. It was really draining and tough on my family as well. So I've kind of enjoyed being at home, being a dad again. You know, my wife oh. mocks me and says, "It's nice to have your dad, dad home. This is what he looks like, girls." Uh, so that's <laughs> been really enjoyable. I've enjoyed the break, getting out of public life. You know, just kind of doing our thing on the side. But look, I'm uh, as as I was saying to you, I've been in discussions, continue discussions about the potential of running at the central government elections later this year in October. October. And if you know, look, if, if something comes up and I feel like I can continue to contribute to serve the community, then I'm all for it because I, I love serving the community. And I think just being here today reminds me of why I'm involved in this kind of public service. I, I think, Chewy, Chewy, I think we take that as a yes. Do we take that as yeah. a yes? Something? Yeah, yeah I've, 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 I've marked it down. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, Afiso, thanks so much. I mean, we're not, we're, the funny thing is we're in Dunedin, but we feel vested in what's happening in Auckland. I mean, I'm, I, I grew yeah. up there, so there's that part thanks. of it. But, yeah. you know, as goes Auckland, so goes the nation. And we are all only as, you know, uh, strong as our weakest link, whether that's an infrastructure issue or a storm issue or a, much like the world, uh, the, the world, well, maybe the world, but the country got behind Christchurch. And we had floods down here in 2015. The country got behind us. It's like that's what the rest of us are doing now. So we really appreciate you giving Thank us some you. time today. And, um, yeah, I look forward to you either being mayor next time around or maybe, uh, you know, filling that office in Mount Albert or somewhere else come <laughs> October of this year. Maybe. I don't know. Just spitballing there, Fisa. <laughs> yeah, awesome. Thanks heaps, guys. Nga mihi, and really appreciate even the support we're getting nationally. This is wonderful. All the messages, all the donations, it's, we really appreciate it. So thank you very much. Cool, man. All the best. Be safe. And uh, good luck with this weekend or this week coming up with the, uh, the weather that's going to still hit. All right, there you go, Chewy, Officer Collins, joining us uh, straight from a uh, emergency meeting. Uh, the chat's been going bananas, obviously. Uh, there is people just saying good evening. We won't go to those today. Uh, we will go into anything to do with uh, Gareth says it absolutely bucketing down in Whangarei. Um, uh, good to hear. Got to look out for the kids. Uh, an eloquent man that would have made an articulate mayor. 
Uh, yeah, Chewie's got a new name. I noticed that a couple of times. It was quite delightful. You've been renamed. Um, <laughs> v says, love Kiwis in their community spirit and groups. Uh, Simple says, the e EOC. The OC have uh, been keeping the mayor updated. Is it EOC or EQC? You know, uh, uh, they keeping the mayor updated on the state of the current operations and what likely impacts would occur in six-hour periods. Therefore, the mayor could have acted earlier. I, I look. I, I think Mayor Brown, from looking from afar, and we are, you know, saying what could anyone have done? What could anyone have done? We have some interesting conversations. As I say, we've got a, a an academic coming up, and I ask him the question. Because he says in that conversation that no one really could see that this where this, the storm coming in was going to be as bad as it was. So I said, oh, so was when Mayor Brown says no one could have seen, it, is that right? And the and the professor kind of goes, ah, you know, it's not not it's maybe not quite as black and white as that. So it seems like maybe as is often in the case, Terry, maybe the middle ground is somewhere. And you know, maybe not everyone could foresee it, but also the way it was acted was too slow. Maybe somewhere in the middle is where uh, is where the truth is. Oh, you know what I'm yeah. Look, I, I absolutely agree. I don't think like he should have been hammering out a, a declaration of emergency at four o'clock, as an example. But two hours later, it was a very different environment. And we started yeah. seeing TikToks of people's cars floating down and buses full of water and all, all, all of that sort of stuff. And they had the, the Elton John concert as well. And I, I think at that point, like, in, in my mind, reading through, I think it was stuff had the the um, the time breakdown of of what was happening and what decisions were being made. I I think between six and seven they should have pulled the trigger on that, and instead it was after nine. Yeah, and the problem in Auckland, we forget this sometimes, sure, because at nine o'clock here it's still light. But in Auckland, you're basically in, uh, after dark. There, I mean, it would be much better to pull the trigger earlier while it's still lighter. Um, yeah, I, I just look and, and that and that message that came out today about the fucking tennis match. I mean, good God, if anyone so my, like I, yeah. I, I saw I saw a tweet from Cam Slater today. You know, Cam Slater, wow, mm. and his response to that was like bloody good mates, meaning who who dobbed him in? Not actually, what? What are no, you that, talking about? That was my first thought. This this is a group of people that play tennis with Wayne Brown, and one of them dislikes him enough to absolutely just drag him under the bus. Yeah, but the, the, but the but the response from some right wingers have been to to put that whole red hanger out there. Why are people sharing his private information? Not what the content of the information was. Oh, I mean, absolutely. as I, we just I've said seen, to Afiso, he I've, he would rather have been playing tennis than doing his job in probably what's going to be the most serious time of his first tenure. Yeah, if he had his choice, he would have been playing tennis. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Ridiculous. So yeah, I I think we've seen the. Uh, a real contrast a and and mayor brown yeah. i think what we saw in the first press conference is mayor brown what we have seen since is mayor brown and his his team and it's definitely okay wayne here's a piece of paper go out look down a camera and read the bloody thing yeah and then people start and asking then, questions and, and then don't answer any questions and leave because <laughs> that that's where it all goes wrong but yeah it's it's, I mean, there's, we talked about authenticity last night. And I think the authentic Wayne Brown is the one that we saw first. As an arsehole. Yeah. Um, and, speaking and of. What we, we saw with Afiso tonight, that is an authentic man. Speaking of. It's very uh, genuine. Evening humans, this event reminds me leadership can't be taught. It's an instinct and empathy is a big yeah. part of it. Yeah. Empathy is a huge part of it. And, you know, comments around wait till when Wellington gets its quick. We'll see how well they do. It's just. It's yep. just ridiculous. Uh, uh, CC says, totally agree with the fee. So that anger won. Maybe it's more help, uh, more effort to be hopeful. Yeah, that's interesting. And then people commenting on how much they enjoyed the fee. So all their disappointment. I'm, but I'm, that's assuming that what that means is that that this person is not mere right now. Yeah. Um, and then lots of support for Chewy, which you know I hate. Um, <laughs> wanting Chewy to be prime minister. That gets people banned giving support to Chewy. We, all should, we should know that for now. People saying who they've voted. And look, interesting from V. V, I didn't ask this question, but I thought the same thing when he talked about, you know, he got 80% of the vote in the South Auckland region as maybe Super City's too damn big. There used to be a mayor of Waitakere and a mayor of Auckland and a mayor of North Shore and a mayor of Monaco. Maybe, maybe that's well, part that's, of the problem. That's a really good point, right? So, you know, you have a lot of different Aucklands. And yeah, yeah, yeah. 
and, and you know East Auckland and North Shore and all of that sort of stuff seem to be really well looked after. And then West and South, not so much. Yeah. Um, so I mean that that's another part. Would you be motivated to go out and vote if you feel like you're not listened to anyway? Yeah. But yeah, yeah so, no, completely. Completely. Uh Deirdre says we need people, more people like this in government, uh, people who work for the communities, not people who rip up carports for photo ops or who would rather play tennis. I just can't I can't get over that tennis one. Eh? It's it's utterly ludicrous. Yeah. All right. Um, let's move on to the second part of the story. This one's gonna be a bit of a quickie. Um, because you know how Chewy likes his quickies. Um, and it's about it's about uh Christopher Luxon today. Uh, talking, and we're not going to play this whole press conference. We're just going to play like 60 seconds of it. Because the thing that I want to learn more about Christopher Luxon is who he is as a man, right? He claims to have this faith. He, he says his Christian faith is very important to me. Now, I grew up in the Catholic Church. I, I, I'm fairly confident that I probably know more about the Christian religion than the majority of New Zealanders. And one of the things I always remember is this idea of, of empathy and care and looking after the widows and orphans and, you know, doing unto others, that sort of thing. So you would think, that as a Christian man, he would come out and his empathy and his most his biggest concern would be for the people of Auckland. But you'll be you'll be saddened to hear, Chewy, this this is not what Mr. Luxon thinks today was the biggest problem. The biggest problem oh, wasn't okay. actually what's going on. No, you don't be you're surprised. I'm surprised too. It wasn't what sure. it wasn't sure. the biggest problem today. The biggest problem was bad labor. Bad, oh. labor bad. That was the biggest problem. He spent all day in Auckland helping. Um, but his big takeaway from this is Labour's bad. Let me play it for you. I think the big news of the day, frankly, is that uh, what an absolutely shambolic piece of communication we've had around whether schools are open or closed uh, at this point in time. Oh, for uh, the, the, the biggest, that's the biggest takeaway from today. Not the community. If you ask Efeso that, in fact, we should have. I, if I was a better broadcaster, I would have. What's the biggest takeaway from today, Efeso? I'm sure he wouldn't say, how the government didn't communicate well enough about school closures. He would have said the people that are helping, the people that are staying up all hours, the community spirit, they would have been the biggest takeaways. But for Luxon, the biggest takeaway is Labour bad. Uh, last night we had parents and principals being informed essentially through the media that schools were being suspended for seven days. Uh, uh, again, now today we're hearing that it's possibly a chance that they could be back on again and reopen over the course of the week. And I just think, you know, from my perspective, uh, essentially, you know, Auckland's a big city uh, and it's got 1.7 million people in it. There are some parts of our city that have been deeply impacted by the floods and that's completely understandable. It makes sense where schools don't open in those areas. But there are other parts of the city like East Auckland and others where actually uh, it's quite possible to be able to open those schools and be able to carry on there. Uh, so that's what we're going to play from this today, because the the one of the big things I wanted to show you is 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 Labour bad is Mr. Luxon's is Mr. Luxon's takeaway from his efforts in Auckland today. The second thing, Chewy, and I said we were going to talk about this, is Mr. Luxon is very clear: some schools should be open, some should be closed, and he's and he's criticising Labour for that. We Chewy and I live in a part of the country that gets isolated weather events every single year, uh, because we have hills around us that come down. Uh, that are up to about three, four hundred meters. We often get snow in the hills in winter. So residents of Dunedin have snow on their properties in winter once, twice, three times a year. What happens in Dunedin is every school is shut. So uh, in in central Dunedin, there's uh, a school, Logan Park. Kings is in North Dunedin. Queens is sorry, not in North. Uh, is, is over by um, St Clair. You probably call that East, wouldn't you? You know, all no. these places, no matter where they are, but on the flat and in the hills, everything gets shut. And everything gets shut because someone may live in the hills, but they go to school in North Dunedin. Or someone may live in North Dunedin and they go to school up at Columba in the hills. Or there might be a janitor who lives over by St. Clair who is a janitor for a school in the hills. And because so many people go, uh, when I was in Auckland, I went to a school called Sacred Heart College, which is East Auckland, but I actually lived in West Auckland. So there'll be lots of people in Auckland who either live in the areas that are under flood or have been under flood or have had the deluge and need to leave to go to school in an area that's not. Or there'll be lots of people who live in the areas that haven't had it who need to go into the area where the schools who have had it are. So what you need to do is just go, right, we're closing everything or else you're going to have half the teachers turning up because they live in a different part of the city that, that is safe, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So Mr. Luxon's wrong, carte blanche, wrong. 
And the only thing and the best thing to do is shut all the school downs. Because then if you don't shut all the school downs, we know how much this National Party hates bureaucracy. The amount of work to then get the number of teachers, the number of staff, the number of students who don't live in your area but go to school in your area into that school or replacements for them is insurmountable. So he's wrong. And uh, the takeaway again from all of the trials and tribulations, all of the hardships that Mr. Luxon has seen in Auckland today is Labour bad. Chewy, that's my rant. Um, yeah, like you talk about short notice communications, maybe they're taking stock of what schools are, uh, are able to open. Um, as you said, you've got staff right across the country, uh, across the city that may have to crisscross to get there as well as the students. But as far as a message goes, which is easier to get out? All the schools are closed or the school is open. The school is closed. The school is closed. The school is open. You know, it's it's for a lot of schools, it's the first week back. So it's like that's all orientation stuff anyway. It's not like they're sacrificing, um, you know, really important lesson and classwork. It's not exams. It's the start of the year. And I, I just think it's a he just wants to go on that message that for for some reason Labour doesn't want kids in schools so they yeah. can go out ram raiding and graffitiing and <laughs> knocking over old nanas and stuff like that. When the fact is they might be helping their families or their yeah. their families are out a, a vehicle because it got fucking washed away, you know, or or maybe they're in an evacuation centre, nowhere near home. Um the but idea, yeah. the idea that Mr. Luxon says, well, East Auckland is fine, so they should all open up. The idea that only people from East Auckland go to East Auckland schools, only people who work in East Auckland are working at East Auckland schools. It just it shows what an what announce he is. It just he doesn't make any he sense hasn't at all. Spoken to anybody? I I'm really sure of that that he hasn't spoken to anybody in these schools or any of these families that are going to this the schools. I can't imagine a single person that is walking up to him after this this weather event and staring down the barrel of another one going, I'm real concerned about little Timmy and little Susan going to school tomorrow. Oh, you know, the people are worried about more than that. Yeah, for sure. So I know that wasn't a long one on that, but I just wanted to get it out there because it frustrated me today and this is my therapy. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, last story for the day, and it's a pre-recorded conversation from this afternoon. As I said, if you're one of our patrons, you may have already seen it up on patreon.com forward slash big hearing news. But I spoke this afternoon to Professor James Renwick from Victoria University. Um, actually, I'll give him quite a good introduction during the conversation, but we're talking about the floods in Auckland. He wrote a piece about this is just the beginning, meaning get ready, New Zealand. Uh, mm -hmm. So let's go to that now, and we'll be back in 15 or 20 minutes to wrap up the show. Uh, we will join Professor James Renwick right now. Professor James Renwick is fascinated by the general circulation of the atmosphere, how it transports energy and momentum and what it does to achieve all this. James is also involved with climate prediction work from next season to the end of the century and beyond. He has been involved with the IPCC uh, and uh, processes since the early 2000s, speaks regularly to the media on climate change issues and in 2018 won the Prime Minister's Science Communication Prize. He is a professor of physical geography at Victoria University, and we welcome him to the show. Hello, James. Hello, Pat, and thanks for inviting me on. Great no, look, we've, we're very excited to have you on. Uh, I'm just we we love um, we love the conversation. We speak to many people who have written for the conversation, and your article in this current uh, day, not day and age, but this day, uh, yep. about all the Auckland floods are a sign of things to come. The city needs stormwater systems fit for climate change is incredibly appropriate. And we want to talk to you about that. I mean, I'm more than happy just to throw the ball to you uh, and say, do you want to do you want to open up by sharing some thoughts about that based on your article? <coughs> and we can go from there. Or I can ask you some specific questions. How would you like to do this? Oh, I, I could just speak for a couple of go minutes for it. off yep. the top of my head, as it were. Cool. Um, <laughs> sure. So based on the article and that title, I think it could be broadened usefully to say um, not just bigger stormwater drains, but the whole question of urban form and, and um, urban planning. Yeah, we have a lot of a lot of asphalt and concrete in cities, right? And that's stuff that water can't flow through, so it flows along. And so if you've got a lot of roads and 
concreted surfaces, the water can't flow away, and that's when you really have problems with floods. So I think designing our cities and our communities, so we've got exposed streams and we've got wetlands, we've got grassed areas, trees growing, mixed in with the built environment, you know, yep. that's going to help a lot. Not even thinking about the the uh, the pipes, the stormwater pipes. Of course, there's all sorts of reasons why we do need to look at upgrading the stormwater system. You know, a lot of the pipes are very, very old, and in Wellington, we've had all sorts of problems the last few years. So, yeah, if you're looking to put in new stormwater pipes, then you should be looking to put in bigger ones for sure, because the heavy rainfall events are only going to get heavier. And we know this from it's essentially basic physics that um, the amount of moisture, the amount of water vapour that air can hold is just a function of temperature. As it gets warmer, you have more moisture in the air. And this is an exponential relationship, unfortunately. So the amount of water in the air or the amount of water vapour in the air goes up very rapidly as you warm the climate. And when you have a way of getting that water out of the air, turning it back into liquid instead of gas, uh, such as a storm, such as yeah. we saw on yeah. Friday, you can get a lot of water falling out of the sky very quickly. Um, and I guess the other thing I'd say up front, I, I'm, I think I mentioned it in the article, it's certainly been talked about quite a bit the last few days, is the idea of atmospheric rivers. So we have these, and these have been known for a long time, and they've been called various things, but the name atmospheric river has kind of got into the public consciousness the last few years. So you hear about them quite a lot these days. And they're just streams of moisture. You know, you, most of the moisture in the atmosphere is in the tropics because that's where it's warmest. And sometimes you get these really long filaments of very moist air coming out of the tropics and heading for, you know, California is a classic example. That's where these things were first studied. Right. But uh, Auckland and other parts of New Zealand are equally exposed. And this is essentially what happened on Friday. Um, so you get these big streams, you know, you can't see them because water vapour is transparent, but the amount of water in some of these things is massive, you know, as much as the Amazon flow, it's, it's huge. And if you're increasing the volume of water in these atmospheric rivers, and we know that's happening, and, you know, the latest IPCC report says it's high certainty that, these things are going to get worse in future. Yeah. Um, you know, you're going to have one and a half Amazons or two Amazons if you warm the climate a couple of degrees. It's not that not that all of that water will fall on Auckland or whatever place it's aiming at, but a good fraction of it will, and you're going to get into bigger and bigger trouble. And at some point, you know, these sort of flooding events are going to be unmanageable. We talk about adapting to climate change, but there's a point where you just can't adapt. You need to avoid right. getting into that situation, you know? I mean, I remember an episode of QI, which is where every layman gets all their scientific information, James. And I think <laughs> Stephen, course, yeah. Stephen Fry asked the question, what's the world's <laughs> biggest river? And, of course, they all said the Nile, the Amazon, they all got it wrong. And he was talking about atmospheric rivers. He was talking uh -huh. about the river, yeah. river in the sky is the actual biggest, yeah. ri quote-unquote, river in the world right now. So, I mean... So it has been amongst, I, mean, I guess, general population information for quite a long time. But when I read that in your article, yeah. it, it made me think, what is that? Oh, that's right. I remember that Remember that episode oh. that they were doing that. Oh, well done. Very good. Yeah. I also <laughs> wanted to know, because you talk in your article about a seven degree change, uh, so 7% more 7 water vapor yeah, yeah. with a one degree change. Yep. Um, and we're already at that. I was going to ask you a question yeah. as well, because part of your article talks about it's not necessarily a my layman's terms, a direct 7% change. You say, uh, while the atmosphere now holds 7% more water vapour, this convergence of air masses means that the rain burst can be 10 to 20% heavier. So are you saying that 7% more water vapour in the air can be up to 20%? Like, I think about water vapour in the air and I think about going to a rainforest, the tropics. It's really big, fat, yeah. heavy rain. Do you mean heavier yeah. rain, heavier falls from just 7% more in the in the air? Yeah, yeah. Um Yes to all of that, um, and it uh, gets to be quite a complicated story, but basically you've got more moisture in the air, you're 7% more with a degree of warming. Yeah, It's all about how you, you know, what happens next. With a storm, you're, you're bringing air together, you know, you, the air rises in the middle of the storm, so it's got to come in from all over the place. So you're bringing in this moisture air from a whole lot of different regions, and, and you're basically concentrating it. It's a bit like, you know, getting water in a mop and wringing it out. 
into the bucket, but gotcha. you're you're bringing more than just seven percent more moisture. And there's there's no real formula for this. Niwa have statistics on depending on the duration of the event you're talking about, how much more rainfall you'd expect with a degree of warming. Um, but basically, the shorter the burst of rainfall you're talking about, 10 minutes or an hour, you can maintain a really heavy rainfall event for a short time. Right. You're talking about a day or three days, well, well you can't. You know, you, you tend to get a 7% increase in the rainfall, that, that kind of number. But for a very short burst, say from a thunderstorm, which again, brings air together, pushes it up into the atmosphere very quickly, um, but it might only last for half an hour or an hour or so, you can get extreme rainfalls in those situations. So yeah. for very short duration rainfall events, you can get, I'm not even sure what the statistics are, but more than 20% increase with a one degree warming. Um, and it's it's kind of a, you know, how long is a piece of string? Um, yeah. With the right atmospheric conditions, you could get 50% more rain. And, and we've seen some of the statistics from Auckland and other places the last few years, you know, that the rainfall was double what the maximum that have been. Oh, I, I, I heard them say in, in a 24-hour period, Auckland got three months worth of rain. Yeah, I think Auckland Airport got its total January rain in, in three quarters of an hour. Or wow. It was, it was incredible. It really was. And it was a very extreme event, and even in 50 years' time, I think it would still be considered to be an extreme event. So it's not as though we're going to get these rainfalls every time there's a storm in Auckland at all. It's, it's going to be a very occasional thing, but it's obviously something we need to prepare for because it does yeah. happen. Um, speaking of preparing, you talk in your uh, article about spongy cities. And mm. I did a little bit of looking up, and this is this is actually the link from the conversation article, and yep. that Auckland ranks as the world's uh, spongiest Spongy. city. Um, yeah. And I, so, for people to know what that means, here's an example. And as, as you're saying, it's the the green area is basically a way that the water can pass through, as opposed yep. to run down concrete. But I guess my question is, and maybe this is more for a you know an urban planner, is how do you how do you do that within a, a city where there's already infrastructure? Like, is the only way to fix <laughs> yeah. this potential problem for Auckland now the storm waters? Because you can't go ripping up, you know, half of the, the concrete at the moment and, and, and grassing it. So do they have to put up with that problem now and then deal with how to move it away from the city? Or could Auckland become, for want of a better word, spongier? Yeah, great questions. And I was very intrigued to see that Auckland is rated as the spongiest city and yet, had this huge flooding problem, so not sure how those two facts line up. But anyway, yeah. um, I think you're right. You can't just demolish a whole lot of buildings and you know dig up all the roads and turn them into parks. That's not going to work. But you can do a bit. I've seen some examples from some cities overseas where, just for example, there's a there used to be a stream that flowed in a certain area and it got put into a culvert so they could build a road over the top, and that stream has been re exposed and you've still got the road but you've got a little grassy strip down the side that the, the stream runs in and right. it's designed so that if there is a heavy rainfall event that grassy strip and the streams in a bit of a mini valley kind of thing can actually hold quite a big flow without the road getting flooded so i think even in auckland you could do things like that up to a point right you're not you can't go everywhere and just turn everything green mm. but i'm sure the city planners could look at where it's possible to do that kind of thing, or where it might be possible to to add, yeah, a sort of nature strip, plant some trees. All of those things can make a bit of a difference when it comes to the crunch. And I think, you know, the, the pedestrianisation of parts of Queen Street or city uh, streets around the country, around the world, that's another great opportunity. You know, if you close off a part of a road to cars and you allow, you know, public transport and bikes and walking and so on, you can then turn some of what was the street into um, a grass strip or a bit of a bit of nature, for want of a better expression. So, I was also, you know, you also going to say that we're obviously talking about Auckland, but this can relate to any city. I mean, we in sure. Dunedin here had a flood in 2015 in South Dunedin that was particularly bad. And that came down to um, our, well, I don't want to be too overly sim simplify this because there is a problem with the, la the where the land is compared to the water table and the rising sea. there's a problem in south Dunedin yeah, for that but yeah. but it seemed to primarily be the stormwaters here were being blocked up you say in your article the country's stormwater uh, stormwater drain system was designed for climate 
we used to have 50 or more years ago. Uh, what we need mm-hmm. is a stormwater system designed for the climate we have now and the one we'll have in 50 years from now. <laughs> it just made me think, James, if, if only there was like some kind of government initiative that could look at the <laughs> stormwater pipes and maybe whilst they're looking at them, maybe throw a couple of the other water pipes in, maybe three in total, and look at the best way to make those work for the current plan and for the future. It just might be a place to start, is what I'm saying. Wouldn't, wouldn't that be great? Yeah, yeah I mean, it might be. You know. Know. <laughs> yeah, so look, yeah, you're quite right. A, a bit of direction from government on all of this stuff. And, and you know, having a national strategy that local authorities can follow, because it's, it's local councils who do the the digging up the roads kind of stuff. And that's something that's been lacking in this country for a long time. And I hope through the whole, you know, national adaptation planning, climate change commission work, etc., that that kind of thinking will become more common, that there will be national plans for what we do with stormwater. And there'll be some funding from central government to help um, change things where necessary. So, yeah, right. it's, it's an evolving area, I guess, but we need to get on with it. The other thing you said in your article that the the mayhem in Auckland, this the type of storm which brought the mayhem, um, but you said it wasn't especially remarkable. That there's a, I have a bit of trepidation with that with that statement. What do you mean though? Because from looking from the outside in, and I'm in the bottom of the South Island, but obviously with anyone who's seen the photos and imagery, it looks remarkable. So what do you mean it's not especially uh, remarkable? Yeah, and I, I yeah, and I didn't I wasn't trying to be flippant or rude there. What I mean, what I was looking at were satellite pictures of the clouds and and output from weather prediction models, you know, the maps of the surface pressure and all of this kind of business. And, yeah, I wasn't looking at the, like, social media feeds and so on when I was thinking that. It's just that, you know, a storm came out of the North Tasman Sea um, and there was a front, yeah, and there was a bit of moisture coming out of the tropics. I mean, you see that often on the weather maps and in the satellite photos and all the data you can look at from the Met Service. So I thought, yeah, it's going to be wet in Auckland. But I didn't see, wow, gee, it's going to be super wet. There's going to be a big flood. Right. Um, all of the, I guess, the really severe thunderstorms that kicked off were not something not something you'd notice from just looking at the sort of data I was looking at anyway. Um, so broadly speaking, if you're just looking at weather maps, it was a fairly run-of-the-mill looking storm. Obviously, it wasn't, right? It had so much more moisture associated with it than you would normally get in a normal storm. So, you know, I, I, what I said there, I feel like I should retract a bit. <laughs> <laughs> it clearly was not a typical storm. But, but, just, no, what, but what I hear you saying, and this is, in, this is interesting because the, the mayor of Auckland has kind of said, nobody knew, but it almost seems like you're saying that's, uh, that's fair because you're not saying you weren't expecting a massive flood but you could see a storm coming. Yeah, well, that's, that's a good question. I wanted to ask the Met Service, I suppose. They did have rain, heavy rainfall warnings out for the Auckland and Northland region well in advance of the storm. Yeah. And they were they were orange warnings, I think, which means severe but not crazy, not, not off the charts. And, look, they've got access to a lot more data and they've got a lot more knowledge than I have. But I guess what this is saying is that they could see it was going to be wet but not necessarily as wet as it was. Right. And it was yeah, only once was. these yeah, these once these thunderstorms got going, well, they upgraded their forecasts and you could see these maps of where the thunderstorms were going and everything, and that was all handled very well. But the emergency services in Auckland would have been alerted at least a day in advance to the fact that it was going to be a wet, a heavy rainfall event over the coming 24 hours. So, so you know, there was warning. Yeah. But not not warning of the intensity, I guess, of the really extreme intensity. Yeah. Speaking of the mayor of Auckland, I'm hoping we aren't like holding up a tennis game for you or something. And I'm appreciative that you are speaking to <laughs> the, these media drongos today. So I do oh, appreciate look, that. I was hoping to get, actually, I've got a dentist appointment this afternoon, not a tennis <laughs> game. <laughs> it's a bit sad, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, I guess so. I guess so. Well, you can deal, you can finish up with these media drongos shortly and then you can get off to that. <laughs> hey, I guess the last question, and it's probably a big, big question that's going to be, you know, months, years, decades to figure out. But what do we do? What, what do we do uh, from here? Well, I think, like I said in the article, what, one thing we all have to do, all countries of the world have to cut down their emissions of greenhouse gases. We have to stop burning fossil fuels to power our lifestyles because that's what's adding to the problem. The more of carbon dioxide and other gases we put in the air, 
the more it warms up and the warmer right. it gets, the harder it becomes to deal with these kind of extremes. So that's that's one thing. But in terms of responding and getting ready for the next big flood, then, yeah, we need to think about the kind of things we talked about, you know, urban design. If you're building a new subdivision or new town, for that matter, think about building in this kind of sponginess. Um, think about having... Uh, yeah, I mean, there's a there's a park not far from where I live that's down below, deliberately below the level of the houses around it, and it's got big drains built into it. It's designed right. to turn into a lake when there's a heavy rainfall event huh. to avoid having the houses around turn their sections turn into lakes. So, you know, we can just be smart about how we design our our suburbs, our our towns, our um, infrastructure. So, a lot of that sort of thinking. Is going to be useful and, and we need to get on with it you know there's been a lot of talk about this for for decades but i don't know there's been a lot of action in terms of redesigning cities that are already in existence or you know implementing that kind of thinking for for new developments so th as well as you know the bigger pipes if you're digging up your roads stick some bigger drain pipes in and i think you know, government's known about this for a long time that has been happening in some parts of the country at least and that's one of the issues that it's very patchwork some councils are onto this and others aren't uh, we need a, a bit more uniformity and a bit more direction from central government on how to proceed here yeah yeah i wonder i wonder as what about local body politics i mean it seems that we've had a bit of a swing in the last elections last year kind of away from uh people let's say with an environmental focus more to back to people with yes. a business focus and so yeah. it's not all that it's it's like i always say to people about buying insurance insurance is the biggest waste of money you ever spend until you need it then it's the best money you've ever spent. Exactly. And it's a bit the same with this, you know, typically who those people are in leadership don't matter until they really matter. And Auckland at the moment is seeing an issue where leadership and direction really matters. And in my opinion, James, you don't have to speak to this, uh, leadership in Auckland seems to be falling a bit short. So you don't need to speak to that yeah. though. You're, you're yeah. a professor and possibly not, but that's fine. <laughs> no um, look, I, I really enjoyed you being with us, Professor of uh, Physical Geography at Victoria University, Professor James Renwick. Thanks for joining us. It's been uh, really insightful. Oh, my pleasure. Great conversation, Pat. Thank you. All right, team. All right, Chewy. I mean, you weren't here when we did that. You got anything you want to want to jump in on that? Um, well, I've I've been reading articles in the last week about um, how to build as you covered spongy cities. Yeah. Um, and I think I think it's a great idea because a, yes, there's the utility of of being able to deal with what we uh, have coming for us with climate change and that sort of thing. Less flooding is good, but it also leaves you with a nicer urban area. It's like win-win. Like who wants to just put streams into pipes? You just end up with grody water everywhere. Um, over behind me here, the the Kaikarai stream um goes into pipes and just disappears right. right yeah i look i mean i i like the idea that the professor said we were talking about a new subdivision has got a park and the park is lower than the houses mm. so that's a really interesting and clever idea obviously it probably also means unless it's done really 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 well that could be a bit of a quagmire in winter but i guess you know that's what you do you have a bit of a quagmire in winter you get to use it in the summer better and if you have an event like we saw in Auckland, there's less of a chance your houses will flood. So, yeah. Um, all right, there's been some messages that I know you've been starring. you want to put them up before we head off? I've got one more um, terribly sad thing to share with you as well. Uh, a little bit of a, um, I don't know how humanity is going to survive if moment to share with you in a sec. But before we do that, is there any comments you want to put up? Oh yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll rip through the ones that I've um, that I've put up there. Uh, arrest JK. Uh, Non-confusing message. All schools shut. Confusing message. Schools in these areas are shut, and those ones yeah. aren't. That's Agreed. That's what I was saying before. Yep. Um, creative creatures. Luxo doesn't want the rich areas to be put out just because others in the city are having a hard time. Goes back to a neoliberal history. Uh, Mr. Rob Burney, one of our big money patrons. Um, <laughs> he, actually, I got a, only... actually I got a con I got a contact Rob because he's he's owed a t-shirt, so I need to get that sorted out this week. I'll, I commit Rob to doing that this week, as well as there's two other people who are, are, we owe um, caps to as well. That'll get sorted out this week. Sorry for waiting. I'm, I've been I've had a holiday. <laughs> so yeah. Um, hey Luxon, 
Uh, only cares about kids in schools because it enables businesses to make profits. Uh, Luxon outing the private school mentality to him. Obviously, kids live within driving range or in the large boarding house next to the school. I think it's hilarious as well because just thinking about uh, private schooling, when I read live within driving range, I think about golf as well. They're all playing golf. They're at the driving range. <laughs> <laughs> so probably both are true. <laughs> uh, P. Blake says, uh, this is 40 years of put off till tomorrow. Um, what is going to happen is cumulative events outstripping the ability to fix, rebuild. Look at Lismore in Australia. Yep, and that's what we've been saying. Look, I don't care. I will debate anyone, anytime, any any time you want about the concept of Three Waters being the right thing to do. The communication and the implementation of Three Waters has been a fucking nightmare and done poorly mm. by a government that didn't know what they were doing. But as we've said, we said it before, we'll say it again, there are neighbours to us here in Dunedin who need 300 million spent on their pipes. The locals can't fund it. And guess what happens when they don't fix to get their pipes fixed up because everyone's dropping three waters? Well, then all the Campylobacter in their pipes flows into our pipes because there's not like a little barrier between the, the areas that where all that all that shit stops, all the lead poisoning stops because Dunedin's pipes are okay. You might be in, a, in an urban area like us and your pipes might be okay, but you're going to get water coming to you from areas where it's not and then it's going to affect your infrastructure. So yeah, it's it's absolutely what we should be doing. But Pat, what happens if we if we stop burning, uh, creating carbon and, and greenhouse gases, and and do all of this work to make the urban environment more spongy and nice to be in, and all we're left with is a better world? Yeah, well, that would suck, wouldn't it? That would be horrible. What a waste uh, of time. I'll share this with you now because the kinds of people that have been like, I honestly have heard commentators on the radio in the last two days all of a sudden coming up with, why can't we do something about the stormwater infrastructure? Like literally they've been saying that on radio and in print. Mm. Why is why are we not doing anything about these stormwaters? And it's the whole thing that's been talked about for a year that these same people have been rallying against. It's just, it's almost, I, I almost think people have to have a lobotomy to not figure out what's going on here, the, the slight of well, But let me, oh, let, me show you, you, let me show you one thing first and then I'll drop. And the reason is because of people like this, right? This is a, a thing going around uh, Facebook at the moment. This is from a Dunedin, uh, Facebook page, someone put up oh. a picture. People are actively going onto $50 bills and crossing out the word Aotearoa. So that's what they thought they would do as their little protest against the word Aotearoa. Those are the kinds of people who have been bitching against three waters. And those are the kind of people who are now going, why hasn't anything been done about the infrastructure? Those kinds of people, if you're someone, and there won't be anyone watching this show, who's crossed out the word Aotearoa, then stop fucking watching us. We don't want you. Like, honestly, I'm, 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 I'm kind of getting to the end. I'm, I'm quite a, I have the ability to have lots of conversations with lots of different people uh, who don't sit on the same park as me, same, same idea page as me, but you, you get to a point where you kind of go and, and, you know, maybe Wayne Brown's brought this out of me, the mouth breathers who are actively going to drag us all down. I'm, I'm, I'm about getting to up to here to putting up with them. And actually it, it might just be better to metaphorically put them all in the last carriage on, on the train and either lock the door or, or unhitch that carriage and let the rest of us keep going forward um, without the mouth breeders. Unfortunately, Wayne Brown would be in that carriage. So we'll need a new mayor for Auckland while we're doing that, along with some other fucking mayors that have been elected, potentially our own here in Dunedin as well, along the way. Sorry. Done. I think I'm that's, done. I need, that, I need a shower. That was quite the rant. Yeah. <laughs> that's it. You do three tangents. I do three rants. No, that's that's fine. Um that completely washed away whatever thought I had. I, I, I'm just struck by the absolute brain worms that, that someone's looked at that. Like, that's been on the money for ages. Are they going to deface their passport? It actually makes it technically, if a shop refused that now, they'd be allowed to. That's the other thing. It's just so dumb. What, did, <laughs> what do they think they're changing? Oh. Brain right. worms. Um, I think we're done for tonight. Is there anything else, Chewy? Any other movies no. you want to critique? Or I, I'm I need a shower. Oh, actually, oh, actually, God. not a I movie. Have said anything. A TV show. <laughs> yeah, Matthew, are you watching The Last of Us? No, but I, but you talked about it the other day, and I I also haven't watched White Lotus. Have you watched White Lotus yet? No, but everyone's <laughs> raving about it, so it's mm. on the list. Um, Last of Us, based on an amazing video game that I loved when it came out years ago. Um three seasons and uh, sorry three episodes in and, and and well the first two episodes amazing third episode 
left me on the floor. Yeah. It is amazing. I cannot describe it. If you guys aren't watching the show, what are you doing? Where is it? You, Where do you see it? Um, on the internet. Okay. It's how right. I'm watching it. Um, right. it. It might be on a legitimate platform, but um, legitimate yeah, it platform. Is, well, you know, like one that you pay a subscription for, I, I assume. Um, maybe. Oh, actually, Neon. Neon is what it's on. It's not, not, you said legitimate platform. Neon? What the fuck are you talking about? Well, legitimate-ish. Um, but yes, it is very, very good. And the latest episode, episode three, is probably some of the finest um, storytelling in a TV okay. show I've seen in a so long what time. So he- what I hear you saying is I need to get up to episode three. I'm looking at it right now. It's, only, it's the first first series episode three yeah. I'm, I'm looking at the wikipedia right doesn't now. doesn't matter if you haven't played the game it's just a good story um where do i know him from i know him i know where i know him from he game was of a thrones secret, no he was a secret agent in um homeland it's called homeland with claire danes oh yes uh he was also in narcos and yes game of thrones and yes. he was the brother um, in game of thrones wasn't he yeah all right yeah, so um, what when when did it good. drop when does it drop each week? Uh, Sunday. Okay, so I have to watch Sunday, three Sunday, episodes Monday. before Sunday, and then we can talk about this on Tuesday, episode four. Absolutely. All right. Absolutely. All right, and, every, and everyone should join in with us. Um, let me also say this. Thank you for joining us. And um, want to encourage you uh, to check us out on our audio podcast. The audio podcast is just a copy of this show, um, but – we're getting some good downloads there and it would be good if some of you wanted to uh, sign up to it on uh, Apple podcasts. Apple podcast is probably the best place. And um, if you do check us out on Apple podcast, be sure to leave a like and a, and a, and a rating because it helps us in the algorithms. It also means that if you ever miss a show, you can just, you know, on the way to work the next day, you can just put on your Apple podcast and you can listen to us. If you listen to us on Spotify, actually the video goes on Spotify. So the Spotify um, versions have the audio and the video on them as well. So, it's an easy way to do it because then you can just turn your phone off and just listen to the audio about the um, insightful and wonderful things we say each night. So if you're not subscribed yet to our, I should take that word daily out, shouldn't I? That's going across the bottom of the screen right now. To our audio podcast, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify. If you want to do that, like when you can, that'd be great. And feel free to share that around as well. Remember, the way you guys can support us, the best way you can do it is to be our advocates. Tell people about us, share our stuff. Tomorrow morning, there will be, in fact, that clip from uh, the professor will probably be up tonight. Um, but definitely, Efeso Collins will be out tomorrow. The professor will be out tonight or tomorrow, uh, and I'll be sending out the links on on uh, Twitter as will Chewy. Share our shit mm-hmm. and tell people about us. And let's it's it's good to see the numbers, you know, going up and up and up at the moment. And that's what we want to do. We want to be, uh, we I mean, like let's be honest, we want to be significant enough around election time that they all come and talk to us. Would that be fair, Chewy? That'd be great. Yeah, that'd yeah. be amazing. And then, and then we'll be able to say things like, "How did this fucking mouth breeder beat you?" <laughs> Which has to be possibly the best question of the whole 200 plus episodes we've asked so far. I am and just the, looking forward to a live reaction of the debates. That's, and that's the good what thing, I'm aiming for. And the good thing is he answered it. He said because people voted angrily. So what he was saying, Afisa was he was saying, not in his words, my words, was the fucking mouth breeder beat me because people were angry at Labour. That's what I heard. And yep. that's a shame. It's a, and Auckland's suffering for that right now. Yeah, absolutely. But uh, but I understand membership of tennis courts have gone through the roof. <laughs> All right. Thanks, guys. Enjoyed being with you tonight. Um, we will be back in tomorrow night from 9 p.m. I won't be here Thursday night. We still haven't decided whether we're going to do a show on Thursday or not. Uh, I definitely won't be here, though, because I'll be celebrating uh, I'll be celebrating a birthday with my lady. And uh, we will let you know tomorrow night whether that's going to happen or not. Um, may happen. It may not. If it doesn't happen, maybe we'll put a bit of a best up of. Best up of? Best of up. Either that or I'll stalk your um, lovely evening out and just film you through the glass. Ooh, you might might have to put some blurry bits on that if you can. No, all right. It's time for us to go. All right, team. Thanks for joining us tonight. We'll see you uh, tomorrow night from nine for another big hairy news. Be safe out there. And if you're in Auckland, we are thinking of you. And I hope the cleanup's going well. And with this new rain coming through, be uh, extra, extra safe. And and don't go to school tomorrow. Doesn't matter what Luxon says. Don't go to school. It's okay. It's fine. All right, team. See you later.